So it's a great honor for me to give the Sinclair lecture today because, as Michaela said, John Sinclair has, had a strong inf has been a strong influence on my development as a corpus linguist. Um, but I'd like to start, start the talk with a disclaimer and two promises. <coughs> the disclaimer is that, unlike any other, all the other talks I've given, this talk won't contain any solid quantitative <coughs> results. Um, it's very much programmatic. Uh, I'm going to talk about m my vision for the future of corpus linguistics, of my vision for the future of uh, the corpus linguistics that I want to do in the future. Uh, this, this fits the Sinclair lecture very well because when I had the pleasure to meet John Sinclair in 2005 in the Tuscan Word Center and sit on the veranda with him for a quiet chat, um, he had this much broader view of development. So I, I was still fairly young after my PhD, focused on methodology and specific question, and he had this much more general and far-reaching view. Um, and so when I was invited to give this lecture, I thought about what my visions for the future are. Okay, now on to the promises. Um, so at last year's Corpus Linguistics Conference, when I was here, uh, there seemed to be a trend of putting funny pictures of animals into your presentations. So I spent a lot of time thinking about which animals I'd pick. <laughs> but in the end, I decided to remain serious. So I can promise you there will be no dinosaurs, orangutans, <laughs> cats, bunnies, dragons, or even chobbits in the presentation. Um, for <coughs> those who've already heard talks, heard some of my other talks, I have another promise. I'm not going to talk about authorship attribution, collocation evaluation, non-randomness, and I'm not even going to mention Zipf's law. So you're going to hear something different from me. Um, it won't be boring. So um, when thinking about the future of corpus linguistics, let's look at the state of corpus linguistics in 2018. Well, what are the tools that we work with most? Concordances collocations, keywords, frequency analysis. Um, so, uh, of course, I'm ignoring quite a lot of work that uh, has more theoretical bend, that focuses on syntactic structures, on proving theories. Um, but looking at the last year's uh, Corpus Linguistics Conference program, um, or the program of the Corpora and Discourse Analysis Conference I just attended in Lancaster over the weekend, um, at least half of the talks uh, rely on these methods and obtain very useful, very good results with these methods. And here's proof just from last the weekend's conference. What does analyzing corpora mean? Concordances, collocations, and keywords. Um, okay, so as I said, I'm ignoring all the other work, corpus-based research with a theoretical cognitive linguistics background that focuses more on speaker alternations and predicting alternations. Um, some researchers, of course, have their pet method. Uh, w so they always work with a particular method that doesn't fall into this basic toolkit of corpus linguistics. The prime example, of course, is Biber's research into dimensions of register variation. Um, and then, of course, you get a few fairly innovative studies. These are usual interdisciplinary collaborations, often involving a computer scientist or expert statistician and corpus, links who work to corpus linguists who work together. That also means for many corpus linguists who don't have access to a statistician, uh, or at least to a statistician that's willing to talk to a corpus linguist, um, it's very difficult to carry out these analyses because you will rely on what the available tools offer you. So, essentially, we're still working with methods that, that were developed in the 1960s and the 1970s. A lot of these methods were introduced by John Sinclair um, in his 1966 paper, in the report from the OSTI project in 1970, and all his subsequent work. Um, the main difference is that today we can do, we can work with bigger corpora, we can do the analysis faster, and it's all much more convenient because we've got these nice web interfaces and software tools. Here's CQP Web, uh, software tools like NCONG or MonoCONG that allow you to do exactly these three types of analysis in combination and link between the different analyses. Um, so actually, um, 
I have to say at this point, I made a slightly narcissistic choice of using only examples from my own research group as illustrations in a talk. Uh, that's uh, my way of making up for the lack of quantitative results, at least to get an idea of what we're working on at the moment. And CKP Web falls under this because I'm also involved in the development of the underlying indexing software. So we seem to be working with fairly old fashioned methods, but um, we're very successful doing this. They are the big, in the UK, we have these big centers such as Birmingham and Lancaster. Um, the Center for Corpus Approaches to Social Science has been highly successful at Lancaster. Um, addressing a wide range of problems, especially those have to, that have to do with language description, with language teaching, um, very strongly in social linguistics and politics, um, political ideologies. Um, and there's also very successful work here at Birmingham in literally stylistics or uh, stylometrics as some people refer call it. So if you look at modern lexicography, it's almost unthinkable to write a dictionary without corpus tools and ex we're using exactly the inventory of methods that corpus linguistics linguists have introduced, collocations, keywords, reading, concordances. Um, so I'd like to illustrate these successful applications with some of the work we are doing at the moment. So that's a, in cooperation with uh, the Department of Political Science where we are working on discourses around austerity. So this is based on newspaper articles from The Guardian and Daily Telegraph between 2010 and 2016, which as always we collected via, through LexisNexis, uh, giving us a total of 18 point million tokens after a very, very painful deduplication procedure. Um, for 323 articles, we also have scanned images that appeared in the articles that directly relate to austerity. Um, and we are carrying out analyses that are inspired by uh, corpus-based discourse analysis, but are combined with the multimodal view of these images. So this is one of these fairly typical applications that I've heard all of over the weekend. weekend. Um, in another research project, we're looking at multiply resistant um, bacteria. Uh, this is done in German, so the idea is not um, to biomedical information mining, but rather to, f to work out what the discourses, the public discourses around multiply resistant bacteria, because a lot of people are afraid. There's a lot of reportage in the press on, on these issues, especially if something happens at, at a hospital. So we looked at discourses in an online corpus related to multiply resistant bacteria. This uses the traditional keyword approach, so we carry out a keyword analysis comparing the frequencies of lexical words in the target corpus, which is limited to mass media, um, mass media reportage on multiply resistant bacteria, um, comparing this to to news to German newspaper corpora from the same time. Um, and then grouping these keywords into categories that correspond to the different discourses. Here's um, the distribution of keywords, the number of keywords found for each of these categories. Uh, as you can see, quite a number of categories are very well supported by a keyword analysis, so again, Corpus-based methods are successful in understanding the discourses there, but there are some categories, especially metaphors, where um, we have some gaps. So these categories are actually identified by a qualitative detailed and qualitative detailed analysis of a small number of texts. Um, so that's also a very successful application that's still in the early stages. We're now going to improve the keyword analysis and also extend it to other data sources. Um, the main interest, so this is a cooperation with the palliative care unit at our university hospital. The interest here is to, these people are interested in being able to communicate better with patients and their caregivers. Um, and in order to do that, they want to understand the discourses. So we're also going to analyze patient um, interviews with the patients. Uh, which they've digitized and recorded and digitized. Um, and 
there's not enough material in these interviews to do a corpus-based analysis, but our idea is to relate what we find in these interviews against the public discourses, because that will influence how the patients and their caregivers conceptualize um, the problem of multiply resistant bacteria. Um, a third research project, uh, that's not so pleasant, third research project that's going to pop up again towards the end of the talk is called Exploring the Fukushima Effect. So our interest here is in understanding discourses around nuclear energy and especially the abolishment of nuclear energy um, after the Fukushima disaster in 2011. This is a cooperation with, amongst others, the Department of Japanese Studies at my university. So here we have an additional challenge in that we want to compare discourses or political argumentation um, across, not only across two quite different languages, but also across different cultures. Um, um, in addition, we want to compare the way these results were reported in mass media to the way they were discussed on social media, especially on Twitter, which is an extremely popular uh, social network in Japan. The interesting, if, or the, the reason why we are interested in this is that in Japan, after the Fukushima incident, at first the incident was downplayed at all, and then there was a strict uh, policy of the government to keep using nuclear energy, and they basically forbade, uh, stopped newspapers from reporting on this or from uh, reporting any anti-nuclear energy um, at, uh, from writing against nuclear energy, um, which of course is quite different to what happened in Germany, where uh, the government immediately decided to abolish nuclear energy for good after the incident. So we had very a lot of material in the newspapers immediately after the incident, but then it died down fairly quickly when Germany stopped using or decided to stop using nuclear energy. Whereas in Japan, at first, there's no reporting in the newspapers, but then there was a grassroots movement, a grassroots movement formed and organized via Twitter mostly, um, an anti-nuclear energy movement until, so on, uh, by the time of the next election in Japan, uh, the discourses started actually appearing in the mass media as well. So because this is such a difficult setting, uh, we're actually carrying this out in a large interdisciplinary collaboration. I think that's also fairly typical of our successful work in corpus linguistics, especially recent work. Uh, we try to combine different perspectives. Corpora gives us one perspective on the data, one perspective of what's going on, but then of course they're expert. In this case, we people from communi communication science contribute a more detailed analysis of the different actors and their interests in such a discourses. Um, Japanese and cultural, Japanese cultural studies contributes the understanding of Japanese culture. Without this, it would be impossible to make any sense of this, even for people who speak a bit of Japanese. And then we have computer science to do the fancy visualization network analysis that you need to make any sense of Twitter data. Um, so we are about midway through the project. Uh, we've made fairly slow progress at first because it's not so easy to get such different groups together and find out how we can work together in an interdisciplinary team. But initial results that we've got, for instance, is to look at the development of various key words, key phrases such as nuclear phase out, which you can see here in violet. Um, here in the Japanese Twitter data, and you can see at first after the incident, um, it takes a while until the discussions on a nuclear phase out starts, but then it's very active on Twitter. And at that time, if you look at the newspaper data, you get hardly anything, any reportage, any reporting about a nuclear phase out. And then there are a few additional spikes which coincide with elections in Japan. So after, at the next, at the following two elections, people again started talking about the nuclear phase out, but then eventually in 2013, things died down and uh, the movement more or less stopped. Good. Um, as part of this work, we also looked at some other Japanese data sets, and this is and again um, shows nicely how much we can learn with our traditional corpus linguistic analyses. So what we looked at here, that was sort of a first 
it was a way of getting our hands dirty and learn how to work with the how to analyze Twitter data. So we looked at the general election in Japan in 2014. Um, we compiled a Twitter data set, just 500,000 tweets, because it was sort of the first la larger data set we collected, and um, there were a few technical problems. Um, so we collected around 500,000 tweets related to the general election using certain search terms. And then we put the tweet collection into CQP Web and started doing an analysis. Um, in a collocation analysis about, so the, the reason why this was a snap election because the parliament was dissolved. So one of the search terms we looked at was dissolution of parliament. In a collocation analysis, we were surprised to see sexual harassment as one of the top collocates, the hashtag sexual harassment. And it turns, turned out that it was actually a frequent, re frequent recurrence of this particular sequence. That's uh, the prime minister's party, Shinzo Abe's party. Um, sexual harassment, dissolution of parliament, always next to each other in this exact sequence. So we took a bit of a closer look at those tweets and found out that they were actually generated by a social bot, by a fake account. Um, so th there was an event sometime early where a female member of parliament was harassed in parliament, which spiked quite a bit of discussion. And some groups set up a fake, actually a right-wing group set up a fake bot account, uh, a fake Twitter account for this politician, which pretended to be this politician's account, but was actually a social bot um, sending out very many copies of the same tweets. All these tweets started with these three hashtags. Then there are differences in text, but um, the way we, we were able to identify all tweets from this bot by just looking at repetition counts. So that's what you got, see here on the x-axis. Oh, now, now I've got quantitative data, I thought I did. Oops. Um, what you see in the x-axis are repetition counts, and you can see some of these tweets are actually repeated. Same tweet is sent out more than a thousand times. So that's very um, obvious bot behavior. But when we took a closer look at these kinds of statistics, we were able to identify several other botnets two which show up as clusters in this visualization, this one and this one, and another net that actually shows up as a diagonal line. So these aren't tightly clustered, but they're characterized by a certain average number of copies. So these are tweets that are sent approximately 30.5 times um, the total number of repetition per user account. The total number of accounts sending the tweets and the total number of copies are quite different, but the ratio is surprisingly constant across the entire line. Um, so that's a bit of additional technique that we brought in, like in, in many modern corpus linguistic studies. But then, of course, we turn back to the corpus data to take a closer look and find out what these botnets, what the purpose of these botnets are, and whether they are really distinct botnets. And so, interestingly, it turned out that this botnet was overtly pro Abe propaganda, just advertising for the prime minister. And the other two botnets are covert pro Abe propaganda. So they, dis they were disguised as strongly nationalist groups using certain terms that only Japanese nationalists use. But when you look at what they actually write, it was always defending um, a defense of Abe against his, distractor, his, his detractors. Um, so these were very interesting findings um, that came out as often in corpus linguistics by seren serendipity by noticing a certain pattern in the collocation analysis. What I wanted to emphasize here is that it's always important to go back again to the corpus data to read the concordances because without that we wouldn't have understood what these botnets actually represent. Which is something that of course all of you know but other fields um, that have been become very successful in recent years are less interested or less focused on getting on staying in touch with the data, on looking at concordances. Um, so one field I have in mind is Stitch Humanities. Um, difference what 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 uh, distinguishes the humanities from corpus linguistics at the current time is that corpus linguistics is still very much based on these old methods on a 
close connection between the quantitative analysis and the concordances, the actual corpus data, the data studied, whereas Digital Humanities has transformed humanities research by making use of all the possibilities, the modern possibilities of computational analysis of information visualization. And, um, they apply a much wider range of methods. If you go to a typical Digital Humanities conference, um, they apply a much wider range of methods and visualization than we usually do in corpus linguistics. Um, Digital Humanities has its origins back in the 1950s, but only with the availability of so many new an analysis techniques with very beautiful visualizations, there's been explosive growth in recent years. And at least if you look at the funding in Germany, Digital Humanities is doing much, much better than corpus linguistics. Um, so I, I'm going to focus here on those, on working Digital Humanities that is interested in analyzing data and analyzing electronic data. Of course, there's a lot of work on building digital editions, digital archives, and creating the suitable software platforms so for this purpose, uh, which I'm not so interested in here. Um, I collected, I attended two recent digital humanities conferences in Germany, and I just collected a few examples to illustrate what digital humanities is doing, in case you haven't worked in the field or been to one of those conferences. So, uh, what you always get at such a conference is my pet peeve, the word cloud or tech cloud. Um, that's the most meaningless visualization that you can possibly make. Um, they have suggested improvements. That's a tag pie. You can see it's the mixture of a pie chart and a tag cloud, which at least allows you to compare things and doesn't assign meaningless colors to the words. Um, but still, I don't think that this is a really very useful way of presenting data. Um, this is also one thing that, one of the drawbacks of tag clouds is they tend to focus the view on a few num on a small number of very salient terms that are printed in large. So if you look at this, you probably get, well, what you get here are actually the names of the place because they are um, shown in largest font, but then you just get a few names and a few keywords, and then there's lots of other words that you can't really read. Um, Digital Humanities also likes to work with topic models, which take this separation from the original text one step further by not creating word cloud, tag clouds, but not, basically tag clouds are based on a form of keyword analysis. Um, but rather, when we apply a topic model, we try to, uh, we identify the, so if we identify semantic topics by their concurrence pattern, by concurrence patterns in text. It's slightly related to collocation analysis, but the result of a topic model is just a list of topics which allow you to do visualizations such as these that tell you that some texts are similar to others um, according to certain topics which are fairly difficult to understand because the best you can get from a topic model uh, as a description of a topic is a list of the words that have high weight, you know, high probability in this topic. Um, I've talked to various people in digital humanities who try topic models. I said, well, it looks nice, but some of the topics were meaningful and others, some other topics were impossible to interpret at all. You just get these words and you don't see what, what the connection is between all those words, really. Um, so you can see this is already quite far removed from the object of study from text data. Um, the same holds for one of their most favorite techniques, network analysis and graph visualization. So this is a visualization of controversies in Twitter. Um, well, you can see that this seems to be, there's a red and a blue group and they're rather controversial. Um, then you, people have applied the same idea to visualizing constellations of characters in, um, so these are actually plays in plays or novels. Um, so this is from this year's Digital Humanities Conference. For some of the novels you might be able, if you could read the names, then you could actually figure out what the character, who the characters are and how they're connected to each other, but I guess in Faust you just give up because 
what you can say here is that there seem to be three groups of characters that have very little to do with each other, which is probably something that you might have known in advance. Um, you can take this further. That's a visualization of the Bible. Or that's the complete history of German drama <laughs> across 200 years. Um, so that's what people often refer to as distant reading in the humanities. That's sort of the extreme form of distant reading. Uh, I have no problem with distant reading. The problem is uh, that, but in this case, I think you completely lose the connection to the text. It's just a visualization. And of course, what you do in this visualization, if you can make out anything from this, it's by picking out graphical patterns. So basically, it's an aesthetic appreciation of the visualization that drives the interpretation of such, uh, of such analyses. And then, of course, uh, they are the completely ridiculous things. Um, so this finds, this was a, that, that's a blog post that I've always been very angry about because what they did is to find certain regular shapes in the development of sentiment across a novel by applying Fourier analysis, which forces uh, the shape to look like this. So basically, the analysis forces these shapes into data that look much more complicated. Um, and I think that's just a very weird presentation of a hierarchy of <coughs> concepts. So, so you get these occasionally. Um, those are, of course, uh, I, I deliberately picked examples that didn't seem to make a lot of sense. But my impression when working across one of those poster sessions is that you really you have this, you have uh, very sophisticated analysis techniques, a wide range of techniques. You have very good looking visualizations, but it's totally removed from the trend data. And I don't think that many of the people there understand how, what the connection between the uh, visual, visualization the analysis result and the original text is. I know that I don't. Um, Digimanities also has nicer looking software. So if you compare this to CQP Web, um, I think this is, it looks about 20 years newer. And it also shows there's a wider range of visualization, a wider range of techniques that can be applied in these standard software tools. Okay, so that's one field we may find ourselves competing with. Um, here's a much, here's a, a competitor that <coughs> earns even more money, which is the field of artificial intelligence research. So basically artificial intelligence was a big thing in 1970s. And then people found out that you cannot really build an artificially intelligent agent that handles anything more than a very, very small toy domain. Uh, so they more or less gave up on artificial intelligence until computers became so powerful that so-called artificial neural networks a very simple mathematical model of how the human brain works, or how neurons in the human brain are supposed to work, um, achieved astonishing results in machine learning. So artificial neural networks are actually a very general machine learning algorithm. You can design different network structures that can learn different things and have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, this, this field also, so research on neural networks also had its origins back in the 1950s. Um, but only with, with recent improvements in processing power, it became possible to actually to apply this to real world problem. Um, to the point that if you've got a fast graphics card in your computer, so gamers are, have an advantage nowadays, um, you, ca you achieve substantial improvements in many natural language processing tasks, in language modeling, so basically predicting the next word in a sentence, various kinds of text categorization, solving analogy questions. Machine translation has been substantially improved by neural network methods. Uh, visual object recognition, they're amazing. You, if you just have to search on YouTube a little, they're amazing films where a neural network recognizes objects in movies in real time. And it gets surprisingly many uh, of these objects right. Optical, so I even the humanities profits from deep learning because optical character recognition has been improved substantially and the latest deep learning models are also already fairly good at recognizing handwriting. Um, and 
various other claims that they've made. Um, artificial intelligence is largely driven by industry nowadays. So although computer science and computational linguistics does most of its research now with a focus on deep learning, uh, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple and all the other computer companies invest so much more money that they're making much faster progress and they also have much more computing power than a mere un than a humble university. Um, and because this field is so much industry driven, there are also very bold claims about what deep learning can do. So uh, just recently there was um, I read in the newspaper that Google now has an AI that can make phone calls for users. Uh, there's this fami famous Obama lip sync site where you can actually have Obama say anything you like and a neural network automatically modifies uh, video recordings of him to lip sync to what you say. Um, some people claim that neural networks achieve superhuman performance. Uh, I searched around a bit, so there's for instance one task in relation on reasoning where the neural network actually seems to perform better than human judges that or than human <laughs> test subjects. Um, they even claim that you can do zero-shot learning. Zero-shot learning means you don't have any training data. So normally machine learning, machine learning works by collecting a lot of training data and then using pattern recognition algorithms to find the patterns in the data and make new predictions. But deep learning claims they are able to do this without any training data in certain situations where they can transfer knowledge they've learned on, in a different task to the new task at hand. Um, and there are even efforts at Facebook research to sort of raise, bring up a general artificial intelligence agent from scratch. So the, the idea is teach the computer like you would teach a child starting from simple sentences to more complex sentences to question answering and so on. So this sounds really impressive. Um, the problem for us is that there are also claims that with neural networks we don't, with deep learning, we don't need human understanding anymore. Because that's uh, what they call end-to-end -end learning, where basically just take a text as input and a desired output, and you don't model your domain, you don't need any linguistic understanding, you just take a very, very deep network and train it for long enough on this text, uh, on, on sufficient amounts of training data. So because deep learning has so become so important, I thought uh, I'd give you at least a brief look at what a neural network actually looks like. That's the simplest possible neural network. So it takes some inputs, uh, multiplies each input by a certain weight, which represents the importance on, of the input and can be positive or negative. So you can have, it's like exciting and inhibiting neurons. Um, and these are summed up in the neuron and then it then a transformation function is applied. That's actually fairly crucial because it turns this from a very simple linear system in a nonlinear system that can model more complex situations. And from this, we produce the output, which can either be a yes no prediction, so that would be used in classification, or a numerical value if you have numerical data to predict. So, this is actually nothing fancy. That's the simplest form of machine learning classifier, a so-called linear classifier. There are various other types of linear classifiers. They're sort of the standard bread and butter of modern machine learning, even before deep learning. Um, so a linear classifier basically can learn very simple shapes, very simple structures. Now, the key trick is that if you add multiple so-called hidden layers between the input and the output layer in the network, then the network becomes so much more com uh, becomes much more complex. So if you just have this single layer that we've seen before, then you basically get linear, just a linear combination of the inputs. But here we have lots of different linear combinations by applying a nonlinear transformation. Um, they can pick out different aspects of the data, of the input data, which the next hidden layer then uses to pick out more high level aspects until you finally produce the output. So this type of network would be able to learn much more complex distribution, much more complex shapes. Um, and what modern deep learning has done is take the network from this to something like this. So you really add dozens of layers. These layers can be very large with hundreds or thousands of neurons. 
Um, they can be complicated, they can be recurrent in so-called LSTMs. So if you ever hear the term LSTM, that's the kind of deep, deep learning network that you would use in language processing that anybody who deals with language will come up against. So you can build enormously complex networks and uh, because of this complexity, if you have enough training data, um, and if you have enough processing power, then you can learn very good um, classifiers and prediction models. Good. Um, so that's the situation at the moment. I've drawn an illustration just because I love diagrams. Um, this is a corpus linguist, in case you couldn't tell. Um, so what a corpus linguist does is take the corpus data, perform collocation or frequency analysis, and then check the results by interacting with the concordance, with concordance from the corpus. So um, this is quite a contrast to how DigiHumanities or so some of the research in DigiHumanities works because we never just look at the quantitative results. We will always check this interactively by working, by not only looking at concordances, but working with the concordances. And I think that's one of the big strengths that corpus linguistics has to offer. As a result, we can produce insights and occasionally we will even be able to um, use them for applications that bring in money. Um, so, so the application here means anything that's either good for society or brings in money. So in this illustration, digital humanities is more like this. So they use a lot of a much wider range of techniques, network analysis, clustering, topic modeling, lots of visualizations and sometimes also supervised learning. Uh, so they would annotate some data, train a supervised learning model, perhaps even a deep learning model, and then use it to an automatically annotate large amounts of data. From this, they directly jump to the insights without ever going or rarely going back to the data. Sometimes they combine some close reading, but then it's just selected samples where we'd read an entire text there's not this systematic interaction with the text that John Sinclair always focused on. Trust the text, read the concordances, understand what's really happening in the text. That's what we do in corpus linguistics. And finally, deep learning just circumvents all the human insights and the understanding and goes directly. So that's the illustration of end-to-end -end learning, goes directly from the text data to the successful application and makes money from that. Now, sometimes when I have nightmares, I begin to wonder whether at some point people will say, do we still need corpus linguistics? So, did humanities has all these fancier techniques, makes use of the possibilities of modern statistics, data analysis and visualization, and deep learning doesn't need human insight anyway because end-to-end -end learning achieves superhuman performance. So, what is our future as corpus linguists? Of course, for all of us, it's clear how important corpus linguistics is, but the question is whether the funding bodies, and in the UK it seems to still work quite well, in Germany it's getting more difficult, um, and it's definitely easier to get funding with all these nice methods, the humanities methods. So I ask myself, so what, outside our traditional research focus, why is corpus linguistics so important? And I think it's also corpus linguistics and the understanding of corpus linguistics is also important both for the humanities and for applications that would often now be approached with deep learning techniques. Um, one of the, what I think is one of the key drawbacks in the humanities, as I've already said, it's too far removed from the object of study, especially the, uh, the work that uses these very sophisticated analysis techniques. Um, it's usually based on an aesthetic appreciation of the visualizations and there is no clear methodology from going from these visualizations to, to the insights, to, to the interpretation. I think we have much clearer methodologies in corpus linguistics than the humanities has for these new techniques. And I believe that's where corpus linguists could uh, bring a lot to the field of the humanities because we know how to combine distant and close reading and we know how to draw conclusions from quantitative data, draw meaningful conclusions. Um, 
And if we don't know, we at least know, we at, we're at least aware of the problems um, and we can work on this. So that's also a direction for corpus linguistics to develop be better ways or develop um, a consistent methodology for working with quantitative analyses and linking them to the text. Um, I don't know whether you've heard about the time machine proposal. That's a digital humanities proposal for FET flagship project. You know, these half billion euro projects that the European Union um, offers nowadays. Um, so they do exactly sort of they, they uh, that's exactly what I've just shown in the diagram. So this is strongly based on both digital humanities and large scale machine learning, especially deep learning techniques. The idea is to have a, to build a platform to record our cultural history, European cultural history, um, to have massive digitization efforts to fill in the data. That's this part of what they call the information mushroom. Um, but as you go back in time, even the, these efforts won't be enough to get complete or relatively complete coverage of what has been going on. So they want to use deep learning and simulation techniques to expand, to extrapolate beyond the available data and simulate the past. So I talked to a number of people from the consortium and they all seem to agree that this sounds very good, but nobody actually knows what to do with these simulations and with all the data. And they all agreed we are lacking a, a good consistent methodology for interpreting such quantitative data, especially data that are generated with sophisticated machine learning techniques. So what exactly do these simulations mean? What conclusions, how do we get from this enormous amount of information and all the visualization and pattern uh, analyses, how can we get from that to um, an interpretation, to meaningful interpretation. So I think that's uh, one aspect where corpus linguistics could contribute a lot. Um, so I believe that in some cases, machine learning and artificial intelligence would also um, benefit from human insights, especially those of corpus linguists, because at the end of the day, even the fanciest deep learning, the fanciest deep neural network is still just a machine learning classifier. So you can do things either supervised classification if you have labeled training data in a categorization task, um, or you can predict some observable quantity uh, which allows you to generate arbitrary amounts of training data. So if you want to predict customer behavior, if Amazon wants to predict customer behavior, they have more or less unlimited amounts of training data from all their customers, from the reviews they left on the page. And if you just throw that onto an end-to-end -end learning network, then it can often make surprisingly good predictions about the behavior of these customers. But if you want to look at something where there is no clear-cut classification scheme, where I don't even know the precise categories you want to find at the start, and where there's also not enough training data for end-to-end -end learning, then deep learning end-to-end, -end, then um, ma pure machine learning isn't a solution. I believe that in this case, human understanding is crucial. So again, I have two examples to try to illustrate where I believe that uh, we can really make a contribution to something that would traditionally be a pure machine learning, um, a pure machine learning task. One is so-called financial narrative processing. So the goal of financial narrative processing is to analyze financial reports made by public companies, uh, written by published companies, and use these to predict the future performance of the company, and especially to identify red flags that might point to a looming bankruptcy or other event of the company. So like I mentioned, there are, fortunately, there are not that many bankruptcies that we get enough that would have enough training data to just throw this in an end-to-end deep learning network. Um, we have to figure out what the red flags could be from a fairly small number of examples. So there's quite a lot of interest in this. Um, the thing is, it's not just a corpus linguistic study because 
if you want to make money from this, if this, should be, if this is to be actually useful, it has to be applied to all the available financial reports from thousands of companies. So this process has to be automated at some point. You cannot rely on just doing a corpus study to identify, to find out or recognize the red flags. Um, this year we had the first financial narrative processing workshop at the LRA conference. Uh, in some of our own work, we try to predict stock prices, um, short-term effects on stock prices from so-called ad hoc disclosures, which companies have to uh, make under certain circumstances. Whenever something happens that might affect stock prices, <coughs> they have to disclose this immediately. Um, and by analyzing the text of the disclosures, we try to predict the uh, development of stock prices, which um, it works, it doesn't work all that well. We got a 48% accuracy in predicting either rise, fall, or uh, no effect. But there's just a 33% baseline, and with a simple trading strategy, we'd still have made money with this information. So you can actually learn this, and that's really end to end learning. You just take the text, bag of words, machine learning model, and directly try to predict the uh, direction of stock prices. So that works reasonably well, but it seems to work for the wrong reasons. Here are some of the positive and negative keywords that the machine learning classifier identified from the text. So a lot of these are just, it's just reading at the surface. So if something, if you have exceeded, if you exceed, if a company exceeds expectations, the price, the stock uh, market, uh, it, uh, it will go up, it will improve. If there's an improvement, if things rise, then we expect the company to do better. If things fall, are weak or are lower, then it doesn't do well. Uh, here you can see Turbon, that's actually the Turbon Group, a German, or a probably a German uh, public company. So AG is German for PLC. Um, so it has learned that public companies seem to do well in general, so that's a positive keyword. That's clearly not a good reasoning. That's clearly not valid reasoning. It's something that happens to be the case in these data, um, but these kinds of clues are what we expect. Um, also, if people have reasons for something, that's a bad sign. Um, and perhaps surprisingly, cancer is a good thing, but that's just because you can make so much money with cancer drugs that any mention of cancer research is picked up as a positive clue. So I believe even though it makes above chance predictions, it really makes these predictions for the wrong reasons. Um, for what we really want to do for identifying red flags, you have to learn to read between the lines, not take everything at face value because red flags are particular cases where a company tries to hide problematic developments or problematic information. Um, so vague reporting, uh, one thing we found is that if a company focuses much more on the good performance of its industry sector rather than on its own performance, that's an indication that they're having problems and so on. If you ha suddenly have contradictions to prior reports or contradictory sentiment in different parts of the report, that could also be indication of a problem. So this is something narcissistically, again, my own research groups project, that's something we started to work on actually. We're hoping to get some industry funding to do this uh, at a larger scale, uh, analyze financial reports. At the moment, we're at the digital humanities level. We computed readability and subjectivity scores with standard tools, with standard measures, and plotted them to see that so item one, did I make an item one and one A? That's about uh, risk factors that might affect the company. Item 9A is the conclusion, the final conclusion of the chairman. And as you can see, um, the final conclusion is much more readable than risk assessment. On the other hand, risk assessment is much more subjective than the final conclusion, um, which tells us exactly, no exactly nothing about red flags and what we really, and the future performance of companies. So our next step will be to um, not do this, which we also did for a paper, uh, but go beyond that and actually do a valid corpus linguistic analysis and then try to operationalize all these red flags um, so they can be found automatically. Um, another research we're currently working on is argumentation mining. So traditional approaches to argumentation mining are either to classify the steps of an argument into the claim, the qualifier, qualifiers that limit the claim, 
uh, premises that can be used as reasons, additional backing provided, a refutation, an attack on the claim, which consists of the re initial refutation, and a re rebuttal, which would be the argument against the claim. Um, another traditional approach to this is to use knowledge mining techniques. So look at patterns such as we need A because B, which would take you from premise B to a claim A. Um, we want to apply this to social media data, again Twitter, because that's so easily accessible. Uh, but it's difficult to apply the traditional, so this standard traditional approach of argumentation mining to Twitter. For one thing, because people often don't argue in a very coherent way, in a logically coherent way. Uh, tweets are just too short to make an argument that consists of multiple steps. And there are a few discussions, reply threads, but on the whole there's a lot more data where people don't need a discussion on Twitter, but just make statements that could contribute to an argument in more or less non-standard ways. Um, so we've just started a research project called Reconstructing Arguments from Noisy Text, which gives us a wonderful acronym RAND. Um, where we want to carry out a corpus linguistic analysis of how people argue on Twitter, uh, with a special interest in implicit arguments, which aren't made logic, where the logical connections aren't made explicit, and argumentation that's based more on opinions than on logical reasoning. Because I believe a lot of the argumentation on Twitter actually is that people mistake an opinion for an argument, but they're still trying to prove a claim or uh, make their point with this, so that's what we want to model in the Twitter data. Um, we believe that a good approach is to use corpus queries, extended forms of corpus queries, uh, very similar to pattern grammars and corpus pattern analysis, to interactively develop knowledge patterns, mining patterns that can then be applied automatically. So this pattern would find attributions of statements, so in many cases that we've seen, this actually means that um, the support for an argument is in the person who said that something is the case. Um, or you could look for patterns like can't be bothered about that or is bothered about that. Um, um, so this clearly is also part of the argument. In this case, it's a corpus of tweets about Brexit, so the argument for or against Brexit. Now, before I run out of time, I'd like to come to my view of the future of corpus linguistics. So I hope I convinced, I managed to convince you and myself that corpus linguistics is very important for the future, both of the humanities and many applications, not only for the future of corpus linguistics itself, but uh, what is our next step? How can we develop the field uh, so that it for instance, makes use of all the fancy techniques that the humanities has to offer. So um, I believe we can, the next three, there, there are three steps that we need to take or that I want to take too. The first thing we need to achieve is interoperability between tools. One of the reasons is that we don't use uh, these more sophisticated analysis techniques is that they're usually separate software packages or just libraries for some language like R or even worse. Um, so you would have to somehow extract the data from the corpus, feed them to the tool, and then you get the analysis, and there's no link back to the concordances. So we need to ensure interoperability to include these tools in our, um, in our usual <coughs> research process. which means making them compatible with CQP Web or AntCong or any of the other software packages that we typically use. Um, right. This visualizes, it. so this, is, this goes <coughs> beyond just being able to use this tool and then typing a, a word that you found. So if you found topic model, typing all those words into CQP Web to find the concordance. Um, that's not an efficient way of working. We need a real interoperable integration where they work, these tools can be used like any other analysis function in our COPA software. The next step, I believe, is to make this, so as you can see, the, 
the big advantage of the concordance is, is that we're actually interacting with the corpus data. We don't interact with many of the analysis tools except in the indirect way of changing the parameters when we realize there's a problem, uh, trying different parameters or realizing that we should change our query a little bit to filter out some incorrect results. Um, so I believe the next step will be to make these additional tools, the analysis tools, the quantitative analysis interactive so that the corpus linguist can interact with them like they would interact uh, with a concordance. So, already, good. Um, but now the biggest step, so this is still a limited, so this still means that this limited form of interaction where I can do something within these tools. The biggest step, I believe, is that uh, we need to feed back <coughs> the insights we draw from that. So this is, the problem is here that we just have this one directional process. When we get to the interpretation, when we learn something from the analyses and the concordances, um, it doesn't affect these analyses. We can change parameters, but that's all we can do. We cannot feed back our insights into the analysis. And I think that's the crucial step that we need to find a way to feed back what we found out by analyze, by looking at the data, what we've understood about the data, into a quantitative analysis, because then we will be able to produce an analysis that goes beyond what did humanities and deep learning uses. And if we get this far enough and everything becomes tightly integrated, then finally we will have the hermeneutic cyborg. <coughs> now if I may talk for another five minutes, um, I have only a few, I have a few first ideas how to go about these steps. And these are fairly initial ideas. I hope that we'll have time to talk about this over, uh, wine, over the wine reception, over dinner, or in any of the coffee breaks in the week. Um, so the first step is to make tools interoperable. So I guess most of you work with the, one of these standard tools that all corpus linguists use. Uh, depending on your preferences and the corpora you need, it might be CQP Web, it might be Sketch Engine, it might be Ancong, Wordsmith, Monoconk, Langsburg, so any of other of these tools. It doesn't really matter all that much, um, except of course that everybody likes their own tool best, because all these tools have more or less the same basic functionality. They can do frequency analysis, they can do collocations, keywords, and it's all linked to concordance, to reading concordances. Some of these have specific extensions depending on the research interests of developers. So Langsbox Im implements collocation networks, uh, but uh, this is very limited and there's very slow adoption of new innovative techniques, usually because the developer of the tool doesn't have enough spare time or they're just not interested in a specific technique. So, what we need is to, because there are implementations of, um, or when people suggest new algorithms, they usually provide software, just not software that's integrated with these tools. So what we need is better interoperability. And that doesn't mean interoperability in terms of a data format. We do have standards for corpus data formats, for corpus annotation, that a lot of tools can work with. That means we can read the same corpus into CQP Web or Sketch Engine or AntConc um, without any substantial changes to the data format, but still we, since they have basically the same functionality, that doesn't gain as much. That also doesn't mean interoperability at the level of corpus query languages. There's also some ISO standardization work towards a corpus query lingua franca. That just means that it's easier to switch from one tool to another because you know what query language, you understand the query language. Um, what this means is that, we, is that we need interoperability between the analysis and visualization software um, and the standard corpus tools. Ideally in the form of plugins, so that will be linked directly um, to the concordances. The problem is that if, you did, if people were to develop plugins for tools, they would sort of buy into a certain ecosystem. So to develop a CQP web plugin would be an entirely different task than to develop a plugin for AntConc. And most method developers don't have the time to 
not only invent a new method and give, uh, produce a reference image, but also write all those plugins. Um, so the poor man's solution is to achieve a more manual, more indirect interoperability if we can just find a way for the tools to exchange the essential information, which is quantitative data from the corpus which must be sent to the analysis tool, to the visualization tool, and the visualization must be able to link back to concordance lines, because otherwise we would still again have the um, nice visualization that's completely remote from the text data. Um, so Gero Kunter's Cockery actually brought, um, came up with the idea of using a tabular data format. That's standard in statistics, he used it in, Cock in the Cockery tool to give users the opportunity to carry out more flexible analysis within the software itself. But I believe that tabular formats could be an easy minimalistic approach to, in to enabling interoperability. Uh, this puts quite a bit of a burden on the use of the tools because in this minimalistic idea what the corpus tool, CQP Web or Ancon has to provide, is a way of producing tabular output in a very f a flexible way of producing tabular output, but the user will have to understand what an analysis tool needs and how to generate this output and generate exactly this output. And then in addition, we need an API that allows the analysis tool to link back to the concordances. Um, so here's one example. If you want to do multivariate analysis, you would export a table that for each that contains frequency counts of different features for each text, where the text idea provides the link back to the concordances. So by providing that to the corpus tool, we can look at the respective text for a certain analysis. Um, and even more flexibly, you can do the same with token level data. So for instance, for each query result, um, generate certain output. And both of these are actually already possible in CQP web, for instance. Uh, the thing that's missing is a way of using these links. So these would be ideas that these um, are syntactic relations, which we could use to produce a word sketch, something that CUP Web doesn't support out of the box. If you had a separate tool, it could use these token positions to actually display all the results for a given collocation in the word sketch. Okay, and this is something that we absolutely have no time for. Um, because I think a nice point to end might be a very small demo uh, about achieving interactivity. So we're currently working on a prototype to support corpus-based discourse analysis, structuring, collocation, and keyword analysis um, with an interactive procedure. So um, what you do in this tool is you select one of the available corpora, still an early prototype, <coughs> type something to search for, and then it creates, uh, basically carries out a collocation analysis. It takes a moment to create the collocation database. Uh, and if it takes several moments, then uh, there we go. So this is different from a traditional collocation analysis um, in a very obvious way because it's not just a list of collocates um, ordered by their association strength, but rather semantic maps. So we use the simplest form of deep learning techniques, so-called word embeddings, to compute semantic similarities of the collocates to give a pre-grouping, a pre-structure. That's also something that people in digital humanities would like to often like to do. So here, the colloquies of theory, you get this, all the um, physics related. Up here, for instance, amplitude, environment, time dependent, condensate, quantum. Uh, grand theory. And you can also, you can now interact with this by making the font a little larger so it's reasonable. You can also um, 
change the importance weightings of the collocates, whether we want to see many or just a few um, strong collocates. So that's becoming more like a tag cloud now. And you can try different association measures, see how that affects the collocates. So that's interactivity at the level, um, at the level of analysis parameters. Um, so, but the interactivity I actually mean is that the usual process of making sense of these collocations is to group related collocates into categories. And that's supported in this tool. Do we see related categories? So quantum relativity, Lorentz belong together. So this gives us now a category relativity, uh, which we can also label here as a group. Um, we can also show the collocates. The collocates automatically hidden become beca because they become part of the uh, category. And the category is visualized according to the average semantics of the collocates that have been assigned. Something I find very important is that, again, this tool directly links to concordances. You can always select a collocate and see the concordances. Um, this is something that should also be part of an interactive tool so that you never, uh, that you always check against the actual text, against the original data. Right. Um, that's So the only thing that remains to say <coughs> is why we haven't got further with the third step. Um, so the third step, the actual integration, the feedback of results. We have some ideas. We, so actually the tool I just showed you is part of an algorithm we started developing last summer, just after I got the invitation for the Sinclair lecture. Uh, so naturally I was hoping that I would be able to demo the MMD alg algorithm and show you how the feedback improves the analysis, how we can feed back insights into the analysis. Uh, but then this happened. Um, I was ill for a month. And so I can just thank you for your uh, 